So, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining our talk here today. I hope you're having a good time at DrupalCon up till now. Um, my name is Mieszko. Uh, I'm co-owner of GoGorilla. And I've been in the Drupal community for about eight years. Um, I'm a DrupalCon speaker virgin, so please be nice to me. Um, and my love for Drupal started slow. So like, like I said, I've been uh, running GoGorilla for about eight, nine years now. Um, but my background is more in industrial engineering and it's in analytics, Google AdWords advertising. So it's not so much about code. Um, like Dries said today in his keynote, so the, so the love of code changes into the love of community and that's what's happened to me, but it took a while. So, um, from my background, I'm more into advertising and the business side of things. And that's also why I, today I represent the business side of things when talking about fixed themes. So I'll be talking from a, from a business owner perspective. And Evelyn here, which she will introduce herself, will be talking from a Scrum Master perspective. So I'll give the floor to you. Yeah, all right. So hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Evelyn, and uh, Go Gorilla or Miesco was kind to hire me about three years ago, and ever since then I'm also part of this uh, at this big uh, Drupal community. And um, for most of our uh, clients, we work in an agile way in, in the Scrum method, and then I act as a Scrum master. But we also do some waterfall uh, projects, so I'm also some kind, somehow the more traditional project manager for smaller projects. And uh, today we're going to talk about um, multidisciplinary teams, how uh, we implemented them, um, and we're still actually implementing them, and also uh, what, well, especially what challenges we uh, came across. And we hope to give you some, some solutions to the problems we came across. Um, but first, uh, let me take you back a year later. May I have the clicker, please? So first, uh, let me take you back a year ago, because um, in 2015, I think GoGorilla um, exceeded about 20 employees, and along with this growth, a lot of other problems slowly arising and became bigger. Um, <coughs> these problems are mainly about planning. So we have a lot of we had a lot of resources who were planned along uh, among a lot of projects, um, which also led to scattered knowledge among all these people of these projects, but also customers had a lot of different contact persons to talk to, so that was also, also not very entirely clear for our customers. Um, and also if you look at the Scrum way of, of managing, uh, a big part of Scrum is to keep a dedicated team for a longer period of time. And also this is something that we were not always following. Um, also, we were still working in a more traditional way of having departments like a design department, a development department, and these departments didn't really, yeah, cooperate. And also, they were like these single islands in our in our company, in our company basically. So, um, well, at the end of, of 2015, we were like, okay, we have to solve these problems, um, and how can we do that? We ha didn't have these problems when we were smaller, so maybe we should try to become a little bit more smaller again and create sub-teams where we have these, these small gold gorillas. Um, and this, this is where the multidisciplinary teams came in. This is not a new concept. Um, I think over the last years we also visited a lot of presentations and conferences about this topic. And I think, uh, well, at the end of last year, this was the time for us to take the step. And um, well, we're currently not, not there yet. We're still, I think, we believe in two-thirds of our implementation. And we're heading towards um, having more than two multidisciplinary teams and also yeah, making the teams actually responsible for the revenue and their, their sales, basically. Yeah. So, um, just to give a bit more context, because that's what I should have said on the first slide. So, uh, so GoGorilla has been growing like 30, 40% a year uh, for the last 
three, four years. So at first, this is rather easily, you know, if you start with zero, you, it's easy to get to one and uh, etc. cetera. Um, but at a certain moment, especially around this 20, 20 people uh, barrier, it really started to hurt. So um, we had like pretty heavy business reasons for doing this as well. So it's not only about, you know, implementing a methodology that's, that's rather hip, like agile, um, but we had a hard time staying profitable. Especially in 2014, it was a rough year. Um, and I think in the end it's difficult to like grow quickly and also keep revenue up and, and keep some money at the end. And this was, was really starting to worry us. Um, and as a side note, I always had an ambition to build something that's a bit bigger than myself as well. So, so when we had this company, it was like more traditionally structured in departments. We had like a marketing department, design department, development, support. Um, it always felt like, you know, you were at the top, like the puppet master. You had to manage all the strings at once. And once you removed yourself, uh, you know, it would stop moving. And this di didn't seem healthy to me, doesn't feel right. And also I think it um, neglects some of the talent in the company because people don't have the room to grow into their full potential. So, so there were like both emotional reasons and also like long-term business reasons to, for trying this and doing this. Um, so, you know, this talk is a bit of a beginner level talk, I think. At least that's what we promised, but just to get a feel of the room, um, let's do a show of hands. So who is in a, like a project manager role or a scrum master role? Okay, so that's like one third of the room. That's nice. Uh, who's a business owner? Okay, wow, so that's another one third. Okay. What, what rep represents the others? Coders, any coders? Even coders came. Nice job, guys. <laughs> and just, just to give an indication, because I think um, like uh, company size is also a factor in this. So, so how many people are you? Like one to 10? Who is a one to 10 uh, business? Okay, a bit less than like one fourth. And then 10 to 15? Yeah. And 15 till 20 or, or more? Wow, that's quite a lot of you guys. So you basically solved all our problems, <laughs> or maybe you experienced them later on. We can talk about this later, you know. So, so as a as a structure of our talk, we have um, twenty or fifty minutes left at the end to get into more details, depending on on how uh, technical you guys want to get, and uh, if you want to talk about tools and stuff like this. Um, back back to this slide. So, why should this be interesting to you? Um, in my opinion, I think we should have done this earlier it's always a very bad idea to reinvent the wheel again. So if you do this, uh, in, in our experience, you end up with a wheel that looks something like, like this. So it's not the most modern wheel, it will be crappy, um, it will break. Uh, so preferably, if you can, you would like to have something like this, you know, a much better wheel. Um, but believe me, they didn't do this by starting at zero. No, they iterated on a existing design and made it better. So it's think, I think, especially for the like smaller companies, it's good to start thinking about these issues as early as possible. <coughs> so um, to sum up for Scrum Masters, we'll be giving some suggestion how you, do can, you can do planning and accountability. That's something we found is important. Um, and on, for business owners, I'll talk a bit about KPIs, so like key performance indicators, how you measure your success, very important. Um, and how you can use those tools to, to build a sustainable Drupal agency business in the longer term. Okay, so... Um, oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> so we're going to um, touch on four challenges which we thought would uh, be interesting for you guys. And the first one is uh, the roles of team members, how to organize them. Uh, because it's not simply like... Uh, like adding um, all these uh, people in a team and that's it. You also have to literally become multidisciplinary. It's, it's not um, just adding these disciplines in a team. Um, so what we did is um, approach it agile, as we always do. So we started 
to implementing it step by step so we could also learn of each step and adapt uh, if needed to the next step. Uh, so this is uh, GoGorilla and uh, what we first did, our first step was basically create two teams and each team consists of our developers, our front-enders and our project managers. So we split them up as, as first step. And what we tried um, for a couple of months is how, to, how the developers and front-enders would collaborate in a smaller team, exchanging their knowledge and also learn how to benefit uh, from each other. And the project manager starts to experiment a little bit on the reporting. How do we show how billable we are and um, how do we show uh, how much capacity we still ha have available. So um, next step for us was to add the designers. So we have interaction designers and graphical designers. Um, we also split them and added them each uh, to a team. And um, yeah, again, we started to, to learn how to collaborate with even a discipline who is even farther from your normal um, daily job. Um, so that was as a coder and also, yeah, as a project manager. But. Um, so that was already something we had to learn and we, we started doing this for two months. Um, and also started to learn how to collaborate between the teams because it's not that we don't want to have any collaboration anymore whatsoever. Um, we still have to spread knowledge between these two uh, teams. So we have uh, set up some several events uh, where these teams cooperate with each other, exchange knowledge and all kinds of things. Um, well, next step would be uh, to add marketing to the teams, and we're actually right um, in front of this, how we call it, at the beginning of this step. So we're not there yet. And marketing can already um, has a huge part in our uh, customer projects, but we also expect that the marketing um, can help the team to promote itself, which can also be uh, very beneficial if, if GoGorilla wants to hire new um, developers, new designers, so that we're actually out there and, and, and telling how cool we are, what we do and what kind of team we are. And I think that would also uh, be uh, very beneficial. Um, well, next and maybe the last step, step um, is to add uh, sales or sales activities to the team. So we're not quite sure what this should be. Um, but in the end, we're hoping to, yeah, to go towards this figure and to see uh, or actually to give the responsibility to the team in terms of revenue, sales, and all these things. So, But we're not there yet. I think we hope to um, take a step in this in the beginning of 2017. Um, so for us, it was really uh, helpful to take it step by step up till now. And I think the biggest, um, the biggest thing for us was learning that the collaboration between these team members, it's, it is not happening just from a split second. You have to really invest in it. You have to learn what can benefit uh, another team member. So this is really where we pay the, the most attention to in the past months. So, and I've been looking at it like a more company-wide situation. So if you take like 2014 and 2015, um, I already told you we had this department, so we were like pretty traditionally you know, structured. Um, with the end result being that almost all accountability uh, was right at the top. If you really looked at it, there were like no reporting mechanisms for, for people working in the departments, or at least maybe there were some reporting mechanisms, but there were no, no, no real consequences when, when things go, uh, not how we planned them. So um, this had a, yeah, this, this effect that basically all the responsibility was at, was at the management level. And, and we, everybody behaved accordingly because you know that that's what, what, what you, the structure supports. So we had like quarterly reviews with the company, but we didn't really share financial information um, as, as management. Um, so we were not really KPI focused in, the, in that way. So it was really easy for people to, and I understand that, you know, I'm not blaming people. It's like the logical consequence that, it, that there were the beginnings of not my problem culture. 
like I would like it uh, <laughs> to you could say so so people were just thinking well somebody else will fo solve this issue and in the end uh, the bill somewhere ends up at uh, at those guys at the top and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens um and basically that's that's my fault you know for structuring it this way so i don't blame people again i don't think it was a terrible company to uh, to work at or that we are dis disastrous bosses <laughs> but you just end up in a situation that works like this and i think it's important to, to, if you can, prevent this and be ahead of, of this by, by doing it differently. That's, that's basically the, uh, uh, the story here. So now, when we have these two, we have two teams, uh, Fertis and uh, Forming, um, there's much more responsibility within the team. Uh, and we have a few key ways in doing this, and I think this is something I would, if you if you take away anything today, that would be nice to to think about this. So, so we use um, I think you can call it the all hands meeting, which is every six weeks, um, and every team is now responsible for presenting its KPIs. And our basic KPI is billable rate. So, so we. The teams report on their efficiencies. Instead, we used to be more like a revenue-focused company, but that doesn't really tell you much about profitability at the end. Uh, in our, in my vision, it's more important to focus on billable rates. Uh, Eveline will go in more into detail about how high these rates should be or what what is the consequence of this. Um, so uh, let me see and. So yeah, so this this all hands meeting it's it's getting more popular. You hear about this at, at, at many companies, but I really feel the key difference is that not the management is reporting like afterwards about those uh, you know, key performance indicators, but the teams do it themselves. You know, and and you end up with a much more transparent business as a whole because. Now nobody can say, well, I, it's not my problem, I didn't know. Uh, and you have like once a year a discussion about the financials. No, you'll see potential pitfalls or any issues much, much earlier. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, challenge two is about uh, managing uh, several agile projects within a smaller team. Um, because, um, well, when you have a smaller team, it's, you're also a bit less flexible than we were before. Like a project was there and we said, okay, this guy has some time, this guy has some time, we'll yeah, squeeze them together and here is um, the project team. But now we have to fit it in these smaller teams. So that is also a, a challenge. And what we try to do is, is sell sprints to customer, customers and try just to schedule them uh, one at a time. Oh yeah, I keep forgetting this, sorry. So, and schedule them one at a time. And what we do is uh, we communicate to, uh, to sales, basically what is our um, available capacity and what kind of project would fit in there. And of course you cannot steer this, but um, this is something we try to, 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 to inform sales about. Uh, would it, um, does it need to be a more development focused uh, assignment or should it be more design uh, focused? So this is also something we try to communicate to sales so that they can actually find the correct um, or actually the right project which will fit in the team. And sometimes we also have to do uh, smaller waterfall projects. And what we try to do is, um, well, schedule an extra iteration in between sprints and just squeeze as much as fits in there so we can have this a bit more structured instead of that it flows through our sprints and that it's more parallel. So we try to avoid working parallel because we're still one team, so we have to yeah, also work as a team and focus on the same goals as a team. Yeah, and then the fun starts because when I see this <laughs> and I think, well, we have these empty spaces, it's like in two teams and I have this very nice three week project, which I could potentially do in, a, in one sprint then I will just squeeze it in there, like over team one and team two, I'll just push it in there and like make money. That's nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and we used to do this a lot you know even at the at the beginning of the of the of the teams as well but even more before uh, when we just had individual members everywhere and this almost always ended not well not maybe not a disaster but <laughs> it it was it was not pretty um, the results were like project overrun lower quality deliveries than you actually would like um, but maybe most important when you like deliver this this project there is again you're back at this situation that there is no real responsibility so because a few individual made it nobody was really hands-on for for the end result and then it's really hard to follow up with the customer with something is wrong or we want to make iteration or a next version so my biggest tip is how big the temptation gets just don't do it you know just don't start squeezing in stuff across teams uh, projects across teams because there are better ways of doing this so so if you come up with this type of situ situation um, consider like um, either extending the team and by this we mean like hiring new people but this might be dangerous if you don't want to commit for long 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 term um, I would actually recommend looking into uh, acquiring like a partner Drupal agency that works for us it works really well um, you could look into nearshoring it for example and the reason why I prefer working with agencies instead of freelancers is it's even a bit more stable you know if uh, agency has a few a bit more resources available um, and you will not end up with a freelancer which disappears or is busy on a different project when you need them the next time um, so instead of like trying to squeeze stuff in um, horizontally or vertically in this this case um, try try thinking about expanding or maybe do some like flexible expansion of your teams it's, it tends to to work much better and the team just absorbs a new team member if it's a few people uh, without much pain in our experience all right um third challenge is about reporting um as uh Mieszko, as Mieszko kind of already introduced um we are uh, at the moment really focusing on our billable rate um and we also set a target for this per team on next next uh, every team has the same target. Um, so what we do is we say 75% of our time we should be billable and 25% um, we can uh, spend on, um, yeah, uh, uh, grow, uh, spend on personal growth. And we can either do this in, on, in a personal level, but you can also look at us as, uh, as a team if, if you want to visit a conference or if you want to learn some specific uh, thing in, in a course or those kind of things so we call that uh, of course r d but um the 75 percent since we also told that the teams are not responsible yet for their revenue and their sales we like to um, keep this figure because it really focused the team and to get used to these targets but also is the most important thing is that we that we learn to be more efficient and especially in in google um, our projects are i think the majority of our projects are heavily development based so once in a while our designers have less tasks to do and um, by adding them in these teams as well we are now making sure that the entire team is responsible also for this designer that he has work to do so they are looking for new things and they are being creative in a different way what work can I help with what will benefit um, what will benefit if, if I um, help around in this team and explore um, tasks beyond the, yeah, the border of your, of your normal daily jobs. So think of um, um, helping testing or create some documentation or, or help out with a customer because they had a lot of questions, those kind of things. So it's really paying off to see that people are yeah, helping each other and, and making sure everybody has enough uh, work to do. So, um, I told you about our like six weekly company meetings. Uh, so, so I told you it was really, really important to really take this uh, take this home. Uh, so I'll emphasize again 
Uh, and we do really do strict reporting on billable rates in those weeks. And actually, sometimes we are a lot above those billable rates, but we know what is a healthy, like, uh, down, down level, which is at 75. Uh, maybe you can explain, Evelyn, why we're above 100, but <laughs> that's maybe a discussion for a different time. Um, <laughs> But you know, there's, there are a few things we still need to learn. And I think if you start looking into this type of structure, you, you should look into them as quickly as possible. Um, and that's also looking ahead because we are approaching this a bit like an accountancy uh, based system, you know? So you look only in, at, in the past, which is all nice. Uh, it's better than doing nothing, certainly. But it gets interesting when you can predict this to a certain point and look ahead. So if you see problems when you billability will drop to unhealthy levels or if you're just too busy so you just cannot do any more projects um, and this this still has proven a bit hard for us to to, uh, to look ahead and this is the next step we are working on so not only reporting back but having some kind of way of, of predicting this like two or three months uh, ahead um, and then you know what's important to tell in, in terms of results because I was telling that this is about building a sustainable business in the end at least it's for me um, so so in 2015 we we did about 85,000 euros of revenue on uh, per full-time employee and we were like with 18 people um, so that's close to $100,000 that that's okay I think it could be higher you know uh, if we are a pretty young team. If you if you if you have, want to have room for growth, it's, it it should be a bit higher even still. And now, when we look after we implemented this, uh, our situation is a bit different this year because we are investing heavily in a distribution as well. But if you count those uh, hours as billable, I think we see about that we are about five more percent more efficient. Um, and grown like 20% in our team size. So, so that's like pretty, in my opinion, it's pretty good results because we had always trouble keeping up growth and sustaining profitability. Now we actually increased both. So, so it, from what we can account for now, it does work. So um, I really recommend it. And just as a final r remark, you know, it, don't, it seems like I'm only in it for the money, <laughs> but uh, in my belief, um, those billable rates are also important because it says something about those 20% or 25% in which you don't need to be billable. So it, in the end, it drives innovation as well. Uh, you know, it, just working for clients 24-7 uh, will, will not always yield the best results in the long, long uh, run. So yeah, I, th I think it's important to think about how much time you want to spend on uh, innovating your company. And for, for us, this seems to be healthy levels. Um, I know about levels which are a bit different. So I know agencies that press up, up, up to 85 or, uh, or even higher when they work on like full-time agile projects. But this seems to work for us for now. Um, and seems sustainable. Oh, I, I didn't mention that we actually achieved 12% profitability uh, in 2015 on, on this. That's an important thing uh, on this 85,000 euro revenue. Um, so it is a healthy business. Um, but I think as an owner, you should keep those metrics in mind and, uh, and see if you can uh, uh, come up with something that works long term. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes, so look into oh. the... F yeah, okay. I'll skip your question. Back to Evelyn. Um, yeah, so the fourth and, uh, and last challenge is, uh, is, uh, is growth. I, I think we have uh, mentioned this a couple of times um, because uh, when at the beginning of the year we said, uh, hey, you, have, um, you all have 25% of your time which you can dedicate on personal growth or, or team growth. Um, well, people were like, okay, what should I do? And there were not many ways or they were not very creative in, in, in these things. Um, so one thing we came up with in, um, is how we call it our developer journey and you can also call it designer journey of course. Uh, but uh, twice a year um, a developer in this case sits down with a few of his team members and, and just discusses um, a lot of technical skills but also soft skills 
and 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 they discuss um, whether this skill is already performed at a at a more um, junior level or a more senior level and level and yeah we have some terms for that and on the right you see infant and uh, silverback and growing but it's just a, yeah, a measure uh, thing and uh, based on these uh, on these on this feedback from his team members um, this person can set like a, a plan in which he wants to focus on uh, the coming six to twelve months in this twenty percent twenty five percent of his time um, well, and as I said, um, he can do it on a, on a personal level, so he can just follow his own path and, and, and make sure that he learns a lot. Um, and if he wants, he can share it with his team. But what we're actually seeing now is that people are trying to, um, to cooperate with other colleagues who have the same interests and are interested in the same uh, focus areas. So we have some uh, small groups of people who are very interested in uh, security or, or performance, and they just uh, schedule their own time and uh, make sure that they uh, set some goals or learn new things and all kinds of things in these focus areas. And the nicest thing is, of course, also that they can even spread this new knowledge uh, in their teams. Yeah, this, this last one is, is, I think, also interesting because this really touches upon uh, like a long-term vision because I think what is important to align personal growth with like collective success of the company if, if you somehow manage to do this you you will be doing well in the long time uh, long term um, and but this this might be harder than than it looks because um, yeah so we have two things you know so we have like salary salary so most people like to earn more when they look are more experienced uh, and they write, write for it. Um, but this doesn't always a a align with making more revenue, especially what we have seen, and this is something we, we could talk about uh, once we're uh, uh, at the end of the session, is for instance, we used to charge like junior, media and senior rates for people uh, to our clients. And, and then if you do that, it's possible to align more experienced people with, with actually making more money. Um, so then they can get more experience, they, you can charge more, etc. But in our experience, the market is changing a bit. Um, and people tend to like flat rates, at least in our uh, business in the Netherlands and some of our international clients. Um, so what happens then that this no longer aligns? So if, if you charge like flat rates and everybody is moving in those journeys, to like higher senior level uh, salaries, then you, you in the end, it will not compute, you know? So, so you will start, the better you're at your work, the <laughs> relatively less profitability you will uh, achieve. So, so this is something we really need to think about. And our answer is actually, we decided to implement one flat rate. So there are like no differences because nobody wants to hire like a junior person. Um, um, but we do have a, like a pretty aggressive growth strategy. So, so our answer for aligning those two is to keep on expanding those teams. You know, so so the more experienced people break off, they, they potentially can form new teams, and you feed um, the teams with with new people. Um, and this is interesting because in my way, the, in my vision, this is the only way to, to actually do this. Um, but you do have a you, you cannot implement this system and just say well we'll just stay at 10 or 15 people i think it will it will not work in the end so if you move to this uh, team structure be prepared to to look for growth you know and at our pace was about 20 to 35 percent a year i guess uh, it's it's interesting if this is a st sustainable rate it seems so but um but keep this in mind. Um, so we're at the end of our talk. Let me summarize you the, the key takeaways we have for you. So if you're interested in this type of uh, um, structure for your company, think, think in teams, not layers of management and, and departments like we used to have in 2014. Um, so if you have 
capacity issues like like I showed you, like trying to squeeze in projects across teams, which is really unhealthy. Don't don't do it. Uh, consider expanding your teams either temporarily by uh, hiring uh, freelancers or maybe setting up some, some more sustainable agency uh, uh, corporations with other Drupal agencies. Um, I think it's really critical to our success in a way those six if it doesn't matter if it's six weeks or eight or whatever but these all all hand hands-on meetings in which you discuss important uh, performance indicators for us it's billable rates makes sense a lot i think um, and last but not least think about how we will align personal growth and like professional growth of people with growth of your company and revenue because those not always align and then you will run into problems in the, in the longer term. So I think we are good on time. So we, we, we have quite a lot of time for discussion. I, I have like one first question prepared for you guys if you are a bit shy and then uh, we can uh, maybe expand and uh, yeah, just talk about all kinds of things you, you think is interesting. So um, just, to, just to start, one of our things we haven't uh, solved yet is about a question about sales. So um, maybe somebody wants to tell about how, how he or she integrated sales into their organization in a team-like structure. Um, because we don't really sure how to do this yet. So anyone, I see a bunch of people shaking their heads like no. I, I think I have a clue on, on how to address this, these kinds of topics. Um, and it has to do with... S sorry, maybe you could... Sorry, you um, I'm Eric. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I thank you so I'm much. I'm sorry, uh, I'm Eric. Uh, um, I might have a clue on, on how to address these kinds of topics because um, many of them are related to um, not the functional role of team members, I'm a designer or I'm a developer or whatever, but more in, in terms of uh, um, people roles, their theory, uh, for example, team role models from, from Hershey and Blanchard that discusses on what kind of people are in a team or should be in a team to have a successful team. For example, you need plants, the people that come up with ideas all the time, and you, but you also need bureaucrats that write them down or mm -hmm. raise objectives or things like that. So maybe if you look at more um, uh, uh, people skills within your team, um, that might be helpful to address sales as well because maybe your developer might be a good salesperson at least for some clients or some projects hmm. doesn't need to be a different person yeah so that's an interesting point so if I understand correctly you say it's also about the soft skills yes. and uh, maybe somebody could develop these roles within their uh, yeah, main role as a developer or a designer or whatever yeah. um, but still then then you know you, you have to have revenue and sales because in the end if you don't the team will fall apart uh, so so th I think the key is where the responsibility l lies you know so uh, I have uh, somebody uh, yeah. at the front yeah. um, I think that it's uh, it's very hard, and it's all on the management uh, in the beginning, uh, to to make sure that if you put the sales persons into the teams, that's a very good idea, but not to give them too many hats, because it it becomes a problem when you have a salesperson who's also involved in the process of producing. Um, and And he won't be able to focus on selling the next project, which is why I don't actually agree that uh, that to develop the team members into salespersons would be a very good idea. But on the other hand, by placing uh, the salesperson into the team, he can take on somewhat of a product owner role and become more technical. Uh, and, and as a technical product manager, which I am now, and 
previously I was uh, a, uh, a sales uh, an account manager and and my problem when I was a salesman and not integrated in the team was that I didn't have the technical understanding mm -hmm. that I really needed to understand what had to be done when I sold stuff yeah. and and now that I'm more uh, involved in the, in the process it's easier for me but then I lose track of the sales stuff because I have to make sprint reports and uh, manage the next week's sprints because I keep getting more hats. So it's uh, yeah. it's kind of like, okay, now you can do more stuff. You don't have to do more stuff, but it's ni nice that you know that stuff exists. Um, so that's uh, it's hard. It, it wasn't really solution-oriented what I had to say here. It was more problem-oriented, but... <laughs> No, but I agree. I think it's a really good idea to integrate uh, sales into the teams because yeah, now I keep talking, but uh, <laughs> we all it, it's often it becomes us versus them when it's the developers versus the sales teams because the sales teams don't have the understanding of what it's like to be the developer. Yeah, and they think, well, this sounds easy. It's only a bit of code. We can do that <laughs> tomorrow. No problem. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's an interesting point. So, but your point is basically opposite to what we heard at, uh, at first. There are like lots of fingers at the end of the, of the room. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm, I'm Hugh. Um, I'm responsible for sales and marketing uh, and partnerships at an agency called Manifesto. Uh, I completely agree um, with uh, your point. So um, I, I joined the agency when there was uh, 18 of us about a year and a half ago. Um, there's now 40, um, so we've grown pretty rapidly. Um, and I initially started the company having come from a background in recruitment, and please no one throw anything at me. Um, <laughs> so um, I had absolutely zero technical knowledge, um, and my natural transition into that sales position was um, to work in kind of an account management, account direction, semi-project management um, basis, um, get to know a little bit more about it, and I've gradually moved out of that now, and I, I run basically sales um, alongside our CEO for Manifesto. Um, and you're totally right, having too much to do leaves you with too many things to do. Um, and we found that something that's been really, really important to us in our new business is to have a decent marketing strategy. So a lot of the way that we do sales isn't so much cold calling. In fact, I do very little cold calling. There's no active um, attack towards a product. It's more um, educationally based. So we host a lot of events. Um, we put a lot of content up on our website and we do lots of blogging and um, we do lots of thought leadership um, and it's mostly network based so we keep our relationships close to our heart and that's why having come from that background in account management I think definitely helped in terms of bringing new business in for Manifesto. Yeah, yeah interesting, thank you. Two more people at the back? Well, we have the time, no problem. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. So I'm Woody. Thanks a lot for the talk, it's really interesting. Um, I have uh, uh, many questions, but uh, two of them that are uh, more important. Uh, um, is there any magic number for the team size? Uh, that's one thing. The other one, uh, is there any bonus system for the team, for the team lead? Well, I'm not sure if there's a magic number, but uh, we like to keep it uh, around nine people max. Um, also, kind of depending what kind of disciplines you have in your team, but I think if it exceeds beyond that, then, then you have to see if you can split it. Otherwise, th yeah, the other problems which I talked about will yeah, come up again, and, and where's the responsibility? And, and uh, too many people to spread knowledge and to collaborate will also lead to these problems again. Um, do we have a bonus? Well, I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. We talk about this a lot. So, um, yeah, what can I say about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a, it's a good idea. I, I would really love moving there. I think we are not up to the level of accountability to make this actually happen. Um, because, um, like you saw, we have like targets for efficiency, like billable rates. And we look mostly behind us how, how it went. If if we like more depth at actually planning for this uh, in the teams itself, you know, now mostly the planning is done by me and the co-owner, co co um, if any, planning. Um, 
once we get there when you when teams are actually responsible for the future i think it would be a good idea to look at some kind of bonus system but but now i don't actually as a business owner i don't think they actually have enough as re responsibility yet to 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 be like uh, entrepreneurs like mini entrepreneurs in, in inside of a company so but, but i think you back to differ well, <laughs> no but in any case i think the bonus should be to the team in my opinion in, instead of a single person because that was what we want to achieve you all have the same goal so in my opinion it would be a bonus for it for an entire team thank you hey my name is shailesh um we have a similar similar problem we have now about 100 people company uh, the way we try to address this issue is verticalize them. So we had healthcare, media publishing as verticals, and the entire team is responsible for a particular target. <laughs> That's a target too. Uh, so they're responsible for a target, and the team co-owns the target and then drives behind it. So there is a mix of subject matter expert also within that team, and that's how they're, we've been growing from about 50 people company about two years ago to 120 this year so that's it. okay that's an amazing achievement well we we actually are doing something a bit similar so i didn't want to like uh, throw it into the room uh, already at the beginning but um, we're trying to do like sales meeting next to next to our all hands on meeting and at the moment it's uh, manned by uh, the scrum masters and, and what we call consulting pro pro project managers and we identify like opportunities for upselling with, with existing customers, which gen tends to be a bit easier. And they are really hands-on, you know, because they know the project, the client in detail. And it's easy to identify like opportunities to, 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 to grow. Uh, but also we uh, share the, like, the sales targets and try to build areas of expertise. Uh, and so also to get management involved and say, well, we have these opportunities, guys. What do you think? Should we proceed on them? We have a few criteria on which we judge uh, business opportunities and if we should move forwards on them or not. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the beginning of a structure, but it's still like emerging, I think, uh, in our case. Um, we still have like the maximum of 10 minutes left. Maybe a quick one. Um, how, if you've got more than enough staff for a number of teams, how do you select those teams, and do you rotate them so that these guys aren't always working in the same teams? Well, um, we actually uh, let the guys decide on the teams themselves. We had like an, 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 an uh, yeah. We had like a setup, but we discussed it with every team member and see. Uh, and, and in the end, also some team members switched because they rather want to be in team A than B because there already were some customers and projects already divided among these teams. Um, and do we rotate them? Yeah, in the beginning we said let's uh, look into uh, um, after six months see if we need to rotate them. Well, that was too quick. Um, but we are going to have these discussions in in a month, actually, to see if we want to rotate them. And I think it would, for the teams, it would be uh, very beneficial. But we also have to look into what does this mean for our customers and our projects and the end of knowledge. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, you have uh, different teams, but basically working on the same kind of uh, matters. And uh, for example, two project teams that have a um, billable rate as KPI. Have you noticed any kind of um, competition demotivation effect? And if so, how do you battle it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we noticed it, especially because one of the teams, uh, so the, the figures of being 105% billable were actually mm -hmm. true because one of the teams is, is, is pretty stuffed in, at uh, some um, months and the other team is working on our in, on our distribution so we're actually not really billable so yeah at the beginning these figures also could raise some yeah uh, i'm not sure um how to call it but 
in the end, it was just about being transparent and that the other team, okay, even though they're not that billable and, and this po uh, moment, well, the company has chose to build this distribution, so we know that we wouldn't be billable. But by explaining what kind of work we do and, and that we're basically doing the same, except it's not billable and that we're just as busy and uh, that made sure that the teams were on the same page again. So yeah, there was some friction, I think. Yeah. yeah okay. We have noticed that as well uh, when we co-piloted this kind of... Um, internal project with uh, mini teams, so to yeah. say. Uh, another question, uh, how do you evade the trap of uh, not my business when you have uh, different teams basically competing each other and then uh, having to do the knowledge sharing, aka, uh, well, this is not my stuff, I don't need to care about it, but instead uh, working with the team spirit, keeping those um, so-called mini teams as a one big team and uh, having the common goal. Mm -hmm. Well, that's w this is one of the biggest challenges indeed to yeah to make sure that the team is all fighting for the same goal and that, that's very new to us especially well across these disciplines. Uh, we we used to start with the design and then the development and when we are at the part of the development, the designer wouldn't basically care anymore, and and. Um, yeah, I think we, we also have the, these meetings within the team to talk about it, to say, hey, um, we, we've noticed that the designer has less to do, what can we do about it? We noticed this, that this goal is not um, achieved by everybody, so we're, it's just a matter of discussing it on a monthly basis and being transparent and try to be honest to each other. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, I tend, to, I tend to agree that transparency is a very big uh, part of this. So like I mentioned, we used to do these quarterly reviews or maybe even yearly reviews. That really doesn't work. So then people get like surprised at the end of the year. So what have you been doing? You, you know, you were like not billable or whatever. So, but if you somehow make this like an easy subject to discuss regularly, it, it doesn't emerge as an issue um, that much. And a different thing is that we started to count our, we somehow we always have the ambition to do our own projects, <laughs> you know, like modules or whatever. And we, we separate those, but do count them as um, on top of the billable rate, because obviously that's time spent being productive, very productive even, giving back to the community, one could say. Um, so, so that, especially when you're working on a distribution our example that aligns those billable rates more to like a r realistic expectations instead of just saying well you're at 20 percent because you spent your time at modules that, that's strange <laughs> so um yes please there were like uh, questions at the back yeah, would you be so nice to come forward yeah um to your question that you had before I think you should ask the teams. If you empower your teams to decide themselves, you should ask the question that you just asked us from the teams. Because if they're not for it, then I think it's a bad idea. Uh, if they don't want to wear many hats, like you said, they won't take it. It's it's bad idea to just push the idea. But if they're open to it, maybe it can even vary from team to team. It doesn't matter if one team wants it and the other one doesn't, why not? Yeah. Why can yeah. it be in just some teams and not in others? Yeah. So that's my opinion on that. Um, I also have a question for you. You uh, showed a lot of numbers and um, talked about the teams, but uh, did you measure uh, how the changes that you made, uh, how the people felt about the changes? Did you measure happiness or uh, spirit, or did you get any numbers on those? Short answer is yes, I think. I'll, I'll get Evelyn to answer this one, but first to get to your first one. Uh, first, um, yes, you, you could um, try to place this responsibility into the teams to make their own decisions, but in our experience, um, this maybe goes a bit too far at the beginning. Because, you know, like I said, people are not entrepreneurs. Some of those people choose not to be entrepreneurs, like a uh, like conscious decision, and we shouldn't pretend they are. Um, and if you try to ask to make them those decisions, they basically force them to, to take on a much bigger role than they used to have like, like only six months ago. 
So maybe I maybe I think we might get there, but it will certainly be slow. So that's that's my opinion on on it, and I think there is a, like a responsibility for management uh, certainly as well to make some uh, some good effort to solve this. Um, I'll get about the happiness question yeah. to you. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have very strict metrics, um, but we do uh, do it in uh, an different ways. The the one team is, is more evaluating it and talking about it in, in the meetings uh, that we have as a team, um, and just evaluating um, on on yeah not on specific metrics actually. And the other team is actually like um, I think it's actually on a weekly basis they they, they vote the happiness it, they had in that week. So they are doing some more metrics like, but th that's. Within the teams, uh, it's a different uh, how they solve it. So I think we answered all of your questions. Excellent. Well, that's about right. We have like two two, uh, two minutes left. Um, so just as a reminder, there are like sprints on Friday. If you're the few coders that are in the room, be sure to join them. Uh, and uh, be sure to give feedback on our talk. So you can go to the page on drupal.org and there is uh, the possibility to, to give feedback. And we'll post our slides over there. And uh, so you can look back uh, if, if you find anything interesting. Um, I haven't talked about GoGorilla much. I s skipped some of my lines at the beginning, I saw. But um, yeah, maybe interesting to know we have like a big project with, with that's open social. Uh, Evelyn is wearing it. It's a distribution for building uh, online communities. Um, you might uh, want to check that out. And you can you can reach us at uh, Twitter. So that's our Twitter address. Or you can uh, also email us at our uh, general address. Uh, yeah, and we have then. a booth uh, downstairs. Oh yes, also and there <laughs> there are almost ten of us uh, here at DrupalCon. Um, and we man uh, the booth at 9.06. So if you want to follow up or just have a chat or whatever, um, you can walk by. And, uh, yeah. All right. Thank you for your attention and have a good week.